yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, today, yeah, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about how to build a um, AI-powered pet detector in Visual Studio Code. And alongside Visual Studio Code, we're going to be using some other tech um, like techniques, such as like a TensorFlow, Azure Machine Learning. We're also going to be using some Jupyter Notebooks, so all that cool stuff. So I'm just going to go through how we can do all that super easily. Um, so just to, um, like you mentioned, I'm Jeffrey Mew. So I'm a program manager here at Microsoft. And I specifically work on the data science and AI tools inside VS Code. So if you ever used Python in VS Code or did data science in VS Code and it made you feel sad, feel free to reach out to me so I can help fix that. Um, you can also find me uh, at Twitter at uh, Jeffrey underscore Mew and my email's on there as well. So uh, being the newest, one of the newest people to my team, um, I have like the least number of followers out of everyone on Twitter. So if you want to help me out, you can follow me. <laughs> and a tiny bit about myself, uh, I love dogs, which is why I'm doing this like pet detector demo for dog, like dog and cat breeds. And I also love Python, um, the language, uh, not the snake. I don't want to keep it like uh, animal theme. <laughs> so I just want to get um, started with like a quick demo of what we're actually gonna be building today and like uh, how we'll all look. So I'm just going to exit out of this and move into my favorite editor, VS Code. So um, I actually have the service running up already um, on the cloud as I deployed it earlier today. And uh, we're going to be just testing out like a quick dog breed. So I have this like really cool website I found. Instead of just doing like Google image search, um, there's this like dog API that just gives you a random image of a dog breed. <laughs> so does anyone have like a dog breed that they like? Beagle? OK. <laughs> So we can just pick like beagle from here, and I'll fetch some like some random dog, um, random picture of a beagle, and then I can copy this image, and then I can go into here and paste this image. So it's from like the dog breed API, and then all I need to do is just um, run this in VS Code. It might take a little bit, uh, a little bit because it's downloading the image and it's going to convert the basically just this is just the test script that feeds it to this um, API that I've already made that we're going to build today. And it'll feed it as a JSON. And then all it does is it'll print the results. So you can see at the bottom, um, it confidently predicts Beagle as like the most, um, the breed that thinks it's the most close to, but also guess like some other breeds, but it has like much lower confidence. So you can see like this one has like 60% confidence for Beagle, but the other ones have like a 14%. So this is essentially what we're going to be building today. So now we can head back to the slides. Cool. Let's just load. So we're going to be talking about how do we actually classify dogs and cats. So it's really easy for us as humans. If we look at like the image on there, we can easily tell like oh, the one on the, the left is a cat and the one on the right is a dog. But if you think about how we know this, it's because at some point in our lives, probably like when we're like four or five year old, years old, maybe our teacher or like our parents told us like, oh, this is a cat and this is a dog. And then throughout our entire lives, we've been seeing like a lot of cats and dogs. And we've essentially been trained to know that, like, oh, this is a cat and this is a dog. And that's why we're so confident in knowing, like, and being able to tell the difference. But we can also see that, um, let's say you don't really know dog breeds that much. So if I show this example, um, you might not know that the one on the left is an Alaskan Malamute and the one on the right is a Siberian Husky, even though they look really similar. But I can actually train you to do this by telling you essentially that, like, an Alaskan Mar Malamute looks like a Husky, but it has, like, a darker fur where Siberian Husky has like a, it looks the same, but has lighter fur. So if I just told you this and then showed you some more images, you could also be trained essentially to tell the differences between them. So you're learning like that way. So how do we actually teach machines how to train um, and classify dogs and cats? Well, we can do the same thing we did ourselves. Uh, we just train the machine to actually learn the differences between them. So we can do this by essentially giving our image or our machine, like our computer or neural net, a lot of images and examples of the different dog breeds so it can actually learn like we did to tell the differences between them. So how does this all work? Well, the basic high level idea is that um, you'll have an image. So in this case, it's just an image of a dog, but it'll be fed into this uh, black box, which we'll call the machine for now. And um, this black box outputs um, the classifications of what it is. So um, in our case, we're going to be quickly classifying between like a dog and cat or other. And I call this a black box because um, this is like not a super technical talk on deep learning. But uh, you can think of it a black box just because you know the inputs to it, which is like an image, and the outputs of it, which is like what the classified image is. And this technique is essentially called deep learning. And why it works so well is because this black box, because you know the inputs and because you know the outputs, um, doesn't mean that you know how it actually got there. There's no like, it's a nonlinear transformation, so you don't really know. Um, it's kind of like a brain in that sense. It doesn't really, there's no way to actually trace back how you actually got to a dog from the image. 
So you've heard the word deep learning and you've heard machine learning, but how are they actually different? Um, you might be asking that. So with traditional machine learning, um, you have to do something called uh, feature extraction. So what that means is like, let's say you have a data set that you want to figure out, oh, what's the best vacation places in the world that you want to, like what are the best vacation spots in the world that you want to travel to? Um, some of your features there could be, or your, like features you can think of as important factors, but some of your features might be like climate or like how much the plane ticket is to that like specific location. So those are like really concrete examples of like features. And also with machine learning, you'll need to figure out which of the features are, and you'll also need to figure out the classification algorithm because machine learning, there's like a bunch of different algorithms you can use. Um, and you'll need to figure out like which one's the best and gives you the optimal results. And where this kind of falls apart is for um, images for machine learning. Like if you look at this picture of a dog right now, like can anyone tell me like what are the features that make up a dog, right? It's like not as concrete, as obvious as something like for um, travel destinations like weather, which is like really, really concrete. So are the features like the pixels on its nose? Is that what makes up a dog? Is it the color of its like fur? Is it these groups of pixels? Like this is where, unless you're like a PhD or an expert in image analysis, you probably wouldn't be able to tell me that. So this is where deep learning comes in and helps a lot. So with deep learning, you actually it actually does um, something called feature learning. So with deep learning, it'll figure out automatically, or I should say automagically, like what are the um, important features that make up a dog. So it'll automatically learn that on itself, and it'll do the classification itself as well. So this is where it's really, really useful, because for images, you don't really know what the features are. So um, there's actually a few several different deep neural nets we can use. But um, for this, uh, I don't want to get too deep into it, but we're going to use something called a convolutional, convolutional neural network, so a CNN. And um, we're choosing this because it's really good in industry. It's been proven in industry by like PhD, um, PhD professors and stuff like that, that it's really, really good for image classification. And uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, but you can think of a CNN neural net as like it just has a bunch of layers, and it'll process your image to the layers, and it'll transform the image each time to actually get the output. So um, now I want to get into like a traditional like machine learning or data um, data science workflow. So this is essentially what we're going to be doing today, but this can also be applied like uh, to like basically ninety nine percent of uh, data science workflows. So the first step is always data exploration. So when you have like some sort of problem, you're trying to figure out like some business logic, you want to figure out um, your data set essentially. So that's like one of the main things you want to figure out. You want to create your data set. Um, the second most important thing is you also want to, you might want to transform your data. So let's say you have a bunch of images. Um, they're all going to be different sizes, resolutions. So you might want to transform them and crop them all to be like 224 by 224 pixels as an example. And the final thing is you want to do um, data sanitization because a lot of your data sets, you might have like corrupt or bad data. So you want to make sure that that data set doesn't like skew up um, those like that bad corrupt data doesn't skew up your um, screw, skew up the training of your model, so you want to like clean that data essentially. So once you actually have your data set and you've cleaned it and verified it, um, the next step is training. So we're going to be training, for example, us. We're going to be doing our training our model to detect um, dog and cat breeds. So to, to training can be essentially split up into three different things. Um, you'll need a training script. Um, probably in Python, because it's the best language. Uh, we're going to be needing uh, some some sort of compute power, because um, if you're training this on your laptop, like you don't really want to wait like a week to like train your model. And just to find out you did something wrong, and then you have to wait like another week to train it, you're probably going to want to train it in the cloud in some sort of like really powerful computer or machine in the cloud that will take, like instead of a week, it might take like an hour. And then finally, uh, we're going to be tuning our model. So um, just because we trained it and got like a relatively good accuracy, uh, we can actually like tune our model um, to make it even better. So it might, instead of like let's say 80% accuracy of detecting cats and dog breeds, um, we can maybe get like 90% as an example. And then the last part is once you actually have your data set and you trained your model um, to like really really good accuracy, and you're ready to like have that model perform uh, out there in the world. Um, you want to start inferencing. So inferencing is basically having making the models a service so other people can use it to, to um, essentially uh, categorize their own uh, pet breeds. So to do this, we need to productionize our code. So we have a Jupyter notebook before, but we want to convert it to like a Python file, like a Python module that can be reusable. Um, we'll want to like package our model. So um, a lot of those times, we want to save our model into the cloud. And um, yeah, because of this, we can push this into the cloud. And then finally, you'll have some sort of application, whether it's like a smartphone app or like a web app or web API. And then all it does is you can pass in like an image of a dog, and it'll return the breed of the dog. 
cool. So let's move on to the data exploration phase for our uh, pet detector. So um, we're going to be using um, a data set called the Oxford Pet data set. So it's like an open source data set um, made by, I think, Oxford University. And it has this data set has 37 categories. So you can think of it as like 37 different dog and cat breeds. And in the, each of these categories, there's around like 200 images for each class. So it can be 200 images of like one breed of dog and one breed of cat. And uh, why I like this data set a lot is because it's mostly fun just because you get to look at cute like dogs and cats all day. So who can't complain? And um, there's also, I just want to point out, there's like an initiative from Microsoft to also publish many of these open source data sets um, on something called uh, Azure Open Data Sets so that anybody can just find them. So this is where you can also find the Oxford Pet data set as well. Cool, so on the data exploration phase, now we picked the data set and um, now we want to actually like check the data set, explore it, and make sure that it's, uh, like I mentioned in the first step, that it's like clean and sanitary and do any transformations we need. Um, so there's many different great tools to do this. Uh, one of the most popular tools that data scientists use to do data exploration is um, something called Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks is really good because it's really easy to set up. Um, there's like minimal installs you need to do. And it's really, really good for prototyping and experimenting because um, you get to run each line of code at a time instead of having to run the entire file. And um, I'm going to use something called, um, we're going to use VS Code for that because there's now a Jupyter Notebook support in VS Code. So you can actually, like, in the screenshot on the right, you can see that um, there's a full fledged Jupyter Notebook in VS Code. And um, where this is super powerful is that you can actually do, like, a lot of IDE stuff in VS, um, inside Jupyter Notebooks where you wouldn't normally have. So you would have things like autocomplete, um, you have things like debugging, variable explorer, stuff like that. But rather than talk about it, I'll do a quick demo of our data exploration phase. So let me just go out of here and back into VS Code. So uh, if we go, uh, I have this Jupyter Notebook file I've loaded. Um, uh, I'll have a link at the end of this uh, talk about like, how you can do this too on GitHub. But um, I have this uh, Jupyter Notebook. And here I've, loaded, I've downloaded the data set onto my computer. But now uh, one thing I want to check is I actually want to look at the data. So um, I can run the cell, for example. And this cell essentially is it'll get a sample of um, each of the categories in the data set. So it should hopefully plot in map, uh, matplotlib. So you can see here it has all of the um, each of the 37 categories and just picks like a random image from those. So these are all the, um, I guess, pet breeds that it's going to be training. And also another thing we can see here is it does some data analysis to make sure that none of these um, the data set's like clean and there's no like corrupt data in that sense. Cool, so now we have to see that and we can go back into our slides. So now that we've verified that, uh, now that we've downloaded our data set and loaded that data set into VS Code and into our Jupyter Notebook, um, now we can do, now we can go on to the training step. So the training step is usually one of the longest steps because you have to do, you have to wait for all the um, passes of training, but um, so with deep learning, it, by nature, it requires a lot, a lot of data to actually tune and train your model to something that's super accurate. And because of this, um, it also requires huge computational resources because um, images are like a lot bigger in terms of data compared to like just text or numbers. So you'll need a lot of computation for that. Um, so also, like I mentioned, with our Oxford Pet data set, there was only around 200 images per breed, and that's definitely not enough. Usually, you want like um, with traditional deep learning, you want like, let's say, like 10,000 images per category. So 200 is definitely not enough. So we're going to have to find some workaround. So there's um, some possible solutions for working with small data sets. Um, the most obvious one is that, oh, we can just always get more data sets, uh, or sorry, more data um, for our data set. So we have a larger data set. Um, and as much as I love going around, taking pictures, going around campus, taking pictures of people's cats and dogs and classifying them, um, it's definitely not a good use of my time. So we want to we want to find a solution that's like a lot more easier and quick. Um, I just want to mention, like, throw this out here. There's also like k-fold cross validation. It's just some like sort of mathematical way to do it, but it's like really really complex. So we don't have we don't want to do that. And the last thing which we're kind of interested in is um, we're going to be reusing one solution is reusing pre-trained models. So it's a technique called transfer learning. So what this means is we take some existing um, model that's been trained by like. PhD or professors in the world that's been trained to some sort of general image classification, like some sort of general problem. And we're going to take that pre-trained uh, model and actually tune it towards what we need. So we're actually going to pick that because it's the easiest to do, and it doesn't require any more data that we need, and it's really, really fast. 
So like I mentioned with transfer learning, it's a really popular technique. Um, it just takes, you can just take an existing neural net and then transfer it, like um, just modify it towards what you need. And how that works is, um, like I mentioned in the CNN slide of how convolutional neural nets work, you can imagine it like a bunch of layers. And all we're doing is we're just retraining the last layer of it, of the neural net, because the last layer is what actually determines what the uh, classification is for the image. So we're going to be using a pre-trained uh, neural net called MobileNet. And MobileNet is something that's used in the industry. Um, it's created by some professors. And it's already trained on things like objects such as like cars, trucks, dogs, cats, which is why we're using it for. But we're going to actually um, we're going to modify it so that it can train between the different dog breeds and cat breeds. And this is just training the last fully connected layer. So we can do this by uh, we can go back to VS Code real quick, and we can show uh, I can show the training step. So this is still in my Jupyter notebook on VS Code. And um, here I can see I run my training script. So we can see, like I mentioned, we're using MobileNet as our base, um, base pre-trained model to actually tune towards uh, training for pet breeds. And uh, I just give it like some parameters like my image directory, where my data set is. And then some more important things are um, learning rate, which is all, what I'll talk about later. But learning rate is something you choose as a data scientist to figure out like it's a parameter of your neural net. And finally, I trained it for 500 steps just to, just to show to see what kind of accuracy we can get. So I ran this earlier because uh, I don't want you guys to sit through um, this training. But you can see um, after 500 steps, we get around a test accuracy of 78%, which is pretty good. And we got this in eight minutes. And for context, uh, when this data set first came out around like seven years ago, like the best researchers in the world with PhDs, with unlimited compute power, the best they were able to get was, um, I think, 59%. And that was probably over like many days of training. And we were able to get 78% in just eight minutes, which is like pretty cool if you think about how far the field of deep learning has advanced in just those seven years. So 78% um, is like pretty good. Um, it's pretty good for what we need. But I think we can do like a lot better. So we're going to do something called uh, hyperparameter tuning. Um, so let me just go back to the slides. So like I mentioned, after you train your uh, after you train your model for the first time, there's um, you can also tune your model to get a little bit better accuracy um, for your model. So we're going to talk about hyperparameter tuning. So like I mentioned um, before, we're gonna we're gonna there's a thing called learning rate, which you probably saw earlier. Um, so learning rate is something that you choose as a data scientist for the training part of your model, and you can imagine learning rate as how big of a step your model to takes towards the optimal goal. So the optimal goal, obviously, is like 100% accuracy. And this is something you pick as a data scientist. So if you pick too small of a number, it might never reach your goal because you're just taking too small of a step. But if you, take, if you pick too big of a learning rate, um, it might just overshoot your goal. And you, again, you'll never reach your goal. So you want to find like a good balance in the middle. And usually, as a data scientist, you have like some intuition of like what generally the number is. But you don't, it's really hard to figure out what the actual number, like the actual number you should feed into the model to get the optimal um, accuracy is. So you don't really want to go, um, like one way to solve this is you just trial and error like a bunch of numbers. But that could take like, like I mentioned, training takes a long time. So that could take like even weeks or days for each of these trainings. So we're going to be using something called um, Azure Machine Learning Service, which is offers like um, a service in the cloud to actually do this for you automatically. So with Azure Machine Learning Service, um, it actually boosts your data science productivity. So it's just like a pip install you just do on your computer. And it comes with like pre-trained models. And you can also. Um, it has pre-trained uh, classification algorithms, and you can easily like deploy your things to the cloud. Um, so the thing we're going to be using from Azure Machine Learning Service right now is the increasing your rate of experimentation. So what this means is, um, like I mentioned, we're going to be testing, uh, our, tuning our hyperparameter for learning rate. And um, learning rate, like each of these runs and each of the ex these experiments could take a long time, maybe like a few days. So you don't want to wait. You don't want to do them sequentially. You can do them actually par in parallel with Azure Machine Learning Service. So it just scales up to what you need. So you can run, like let's say, 100 different values at the same time. And it'll just all run at the same time. It'll pick the best one for you. And finally, uh, what we'll need in the next step later is the productionizing your machine learning service. So here you can actually easily deploy and manage um, your model to the cloud. But I'll talk about that later. And here's some other things that Azure Machine Learning Service does. But we're going to mostly focus on the first point, which is the simplified hyperparameter tuning, which we're going to do right now. So uh, let's go back to VS Code again. And if I go into my notebook, oops. If I go into my notebook, um, so my later cells, here's where I set up the Azure Machine Learning. So here's where like, I um, log in with my credentials. And then here I uh, upload my files, essentially, to the cloud. 
And here is where the code is for actually doing the hyperparameter tuning. So the service in Azure Machine Learning for hyperparameter tuning is called a hyperdrive. So um, this is the main code that does it. So you can see, um, so I have a pip installed the Azure Machine Learning SDK. But um, here I create an estimator from TensorFlow. So this is what actually has my model. And um, I give it the same training script that I ran locally that got me that 80 or so that 78% on my local computer. I give it to the uh, estimator, which will train it in the cloud. And here's the important co code that we need. So um, like I mentioned, we were going to be uh, experimenting with learning rate. So um, instead of just giving it a value and testing it manually, we're going to say we're going to randomly test values um, in a log uniform between negative um, 15 to negative 3. So just pick a bunch of these values and test them. And finally, the most important thing, a uh, really, really cool thing, is we'll have an early termination policy. So um, I'll show you a little bit more detail of this in a bit. But essentially, what it's saying is that um, since it's doing a bunch of these runs in parallel, if it'll say if it detects a run, if it's doing an experiment, and it picks uh, some sort of learning rate, and that learning rate is getting your accuracy, um, the accuracy from that learning rate is actually less than 15% of the most, the best learning rate you've seen so, uh, sorry, of the best accuracy you've seen so far, then just kill it because it's kind of like a lost cause at that point and you don't want to waste your compute power. So this is where Azure Machine Learning Service can actually like save you a lot of money because you're not wasting compute power on like um, runs that you know are going to fail. So this is where I actually start running it into the cloud. And um, for the sake of time again, uh, I've done, I've already uh, done this a little bit earlier. So you can see this is the experiment um, when you actually run, uh, when I run the cell in VS Code, um, it generates this experiment in the cloud. And uh, I've logged into Azure, uh, the Azure Web Portal, and you can see um, after just only like 200 runs with, uh, like th these are the different learning rates I've tried, um, you can see that I've got like some of the best models I've gotten have around 90% accuracy. So we've already boosted our accuracy from the 78% initially that I've trained on my computer to 90% just by essentially almost doing nothing. I just hook this up to Azure Machine Learning Service and tell them to do it, to pick the best hyperparameter for me. So that's really, really cool that we just essentially got extra 10% accuracy for doing nothing. And uh, like I mentioned, the early termination stuff, you can see like some of these runs didn't complete. And this is where the early, early termination policy that I was talking about. So it saw that the accuracy was like so much worse than this like 90% one. So it realizes like there's no point continuing. You might as well just give up and then reuse that compute power that you already are paying for for um, like actual like runs that will actually generate good results. So you can see, um, yeah, I got around like some of the best models. I get around like 90% now. So you can see the 0 0.91 on the right, and that's the um, accuracy. So from here, um, I can actually I'll take like the best. Uh, I'll take the best run, so um, I can actually find like you know, Azure Machine Learning Service will tell me which learning rate actually gave me the best run. So I'll actually take that model that gives me the ninety percent accuracy. So let's go back to the slides real quick. Um, so then now, now that we've actually done the hyperparameter tuning, once this loads, we need to start productionizing our model. So this is so now that we have a really really good model. Uh, let's go back here. Now we have a really, really good model. We want to actually productionize it so we can push it into the cloud so the others can actually um, call the service to actually do that pet detection that they want. So to do this, we want to make a Python module since uh, right now we just have a Jupyter notebook and it's kind of like messy code. We want to create it to like, we want to refactor it to good code. Um, and to do this, again, we can use Visual Studio Code again. So we have this really cool feature inside the notebook editor, the Jupyter Notebook editor that I just showed you that automatically converts your Jupyter Notebook code into Python code. And once it's in Python code, you have full access to all your traditional like Python editing environment in VS Code and all your good like refactoring stuff. So you can do things such as like refactor, um, variable explorer, data explorer. Um, you, can, you have access, again, to autocompletion. So again, I can show you that real quick um, in VS Code. So this is my notebook. Um, there's this button up top, at the top right, and it says convert and save to a Python script. So if I click that, um, it'll generate essentially this file. Um, so you can see it's this, the same code. So if I scroll to the top of this Jupyter notebook, it's literally the same code, but now like you see the CD images. You'll see like a CD images, uh, I believe, up here somewhere. But um, it just generates the same, yeah, sorry, CD images right here. So it generates literally the same code, but now in a Python file. So normally, 
um, as a data scientist, if you want to start productionizing your code, you would normally have to copy and paste all these cells into a new Python file. But because of this functionality, we can now just automatically do it for you and save you the time. And once you actually have it in this um, uh, generated Python file, you can start using like some of the refactoring tools, such as like exporting or extracting variables, extracting methods, um, and then you would have um, a final script that essentially does um, does everything you need in much cleaner code. Cool. So now the last part is we want to start uh, now that we've actually cleaned up our code, we want to actually deploy our code, our um, our model and code to the cloud. So this is where the deployment part of Azure Machine Learning learning service comes in. So uh, to deploy, we're going to actually do this again in VS Code. I can see there's like a common theme of everything can be done right now in VS Code, but um, we're going to be using the Azure Machine Learning Service extension, which also is, again, free. And um, because of this, I can log into my Azure account that I used previously. And I can do things such as like submit experiments, which I just did before. But the more important two things I want to do are register my model. So that model that I already that I did the hyperparameter tuning with, I got that 90%. I can actually register that model and deploy that model to the cloud so others can use it. So you can see uh, if I go back to uh, one last time to VS Code, um, I have the Azure Machine Learning Service right here. This is the extension. And um, you can see that here's the endpoints. And all I, need, all I need to do is deploy service. And because I actually ran that experiment in the cloud, you can see the model that generated that saved the best model is already here. So all I needed to do is just do deploy service, um, click registered model, and then it'll pick one of the models from here. Um, yeah, so you can see like um, here's some like the models that were created, but um, I just saved like the best one that got me that 90%, and it's already in AML, so I just need to select the right one. Um, but again, for the sake of time, I've already deployed this, which is why you saw in the beginning um, I can already start detecting model. Um, I can already run this test script that uh, pings this endpoint to get me the dog breed. Cool. So um, I guess, yeah, just to wrap up, um, let's just talk about everything we've done today and how you can also apply this workflow um, to your own data science needs. So in review, um, like I mentioned, the machine learning workflow, we started with um, data exploration. So for us, we found the Oxford PET data set. And we downloaded that into our machine, and then we actually did some. Um, we uh, loaded it into our Jupyter notebook, and then we actually cleaned up that code, uh, cleaned up that data, and actually saw like on that map, on that graph, like some of the samples of the images we have. Um, the next step is so yeah, we used this. We used the pet data set and Jupyter notebook for that. The next step is we did training. So we had our training script again in uh, our Jupyter notebook in VS Code, and our compute we did as well. And then finally, the tuning is the hyperparameter tuning. So that's where we got that 79 or 78% from our regular training script and compute. But the tuning made it all jump all the way to 90%. And again, we for the compute and tuning, we used the um, Azure Machine Learning Service. And then finally, um, we did inferencing. So once we actually had our model um, and we trained it with our good data, we want to productionize that to the cloud. So um, again, we used VS Code for this by converting our Jupyter Notebook into a Python file. And then from that Python file, we were able to do a lot of refactoring. And then um, from that, and then we were able to deploy that code and model to the cloud with the Azure Machine Learning Service extension that I just showed. So we uploaded that to the cloud, and that was using Azure Machine Learning Service. And we have our application. And the final thing is that um, we can see that all of this was done inside the VS Code and the Python extension for VS Code, which is all cross-platform, open source, and completely free. So um, yeah, so what's next? Well, you can actually build your own pet detector, um, just like I did. So here's like a, a link to the GitHub repo. I'll, I'll have this. I'll post this up later, so you can take pictures. But um, you can train it to whatever you want. So for us, we did pet detector, but maybe you want to do like a Pokemon detector or something. You can do that. Um, we can try out the uh, VS Code Jupyter support today. So some like the Jupyter Notebook stuff I showed inside VS Code, that's all already available. It just came out um, in October. So our team worked on that. So it'd be really cool if you guys check it out. And um, for more information about the Python extension, which is where actually the Jupyter Notebook support is, um, here's a link for that. And finally, the last one is if you want to learn a little bit more about the Azure Machine Learning Service, where we did some of the hyperparameter tuning and deploying to the cloud, and we have that. But yeah, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter or email. And um, we're also in a Microsoft booth, the VS Code booth, right outside. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey Mew. Do we have any questions? 
Could you go into a little bit more detail about how you were able to sanitize the images and more specifically how you were able to verify that the images were properly sanitized because, you know, you don't want to sit through all thousands of images. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, so I kind of like cheated a little bit here in the sense that um, so for like a um, since this is the Oxford pet data set, so it's from Oxford, it's like a reputable um, it's like something reputable, so I already kind of knew that it was clean, so I didn't really have to go through the cleaning of it. But um, one thing I did just to make sure that um, there was like no like bad values is I just printed out like I just picked like sample images. I just randomly picked images from the data set and printed it and made sure that like oh like for example this is like the right picture for like the right breed stuff like that. But mostly I kind of cheated in the sense that I knew that it's Oxford pet data set. A lot of people use it, and it's from the university, so they already. They basically said they already cleaned it for us, so we don't have to do that. But sometimes if you were trying to do some like training from scratch and you don't have your own data set, you would have to manually do this yourself, like maybe with Python code or something, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks, it's a, uh, it's a very good talk. Uh, so for the small data sets, uh, mm-hmm. when you're picking between K-fold validation and transfer learning, how do you decide which way mm-hmm. to go? Well, um, for the sake of this talk, it was like something, I just want to show something basic, but um, uh, the reason I did transfer learning is because uh, transfer learning essentially you can you're already guaranteed to get good results because you're already using a pre-existing model that's already good. You're just trying to tune it towards what we need. Um, where K-fold cross validation, this is like a little bit more technical, but where K-fold cross validation works um, better is, let's say you have, um, oh, I mean I guess you can also apply that K-fold cross validation with um, the transfer learning, but K-fold cross validation is I guess better when you have. Um, I guess a little, like a little bit more data in that sense because what Crayful cross validation, how you can think of it, how it works is it'll basically randomize your data set each time. So then to your model, it looks like it's a new data set each time, right? So that's basically how Kful cross validation works. But in practice, um, we want to just want to do something easy, and Kful cross validation requires like a lot more coding and stuff like that, and it requires like a lot more runs essentially. So we did transfer learning because um, we only had to do like you saw we only did it only took eight minutes to do because we already had an existing model, and also we didn't need to do any more, essentially we didn't need to do any more coding to do it. So we just picked something that was super easy for our needs. But there are definitely times where capable cross-validation will help you um, more. So is there any minimum uh, data size limit for the transfer learning mm-hmm. process? It's definitely like a heuristics thing. So um, it depends like how complex your data is. So like maybe um, since we're detecting pet breeds, for example, uh, like the pets are like kind of like dogs are like pretty similar like in looks I guess but if you're detecting I guess like some different objects like maybe I don't know like a chair and like a car I'll give you an example I am working on a similar uh, uh, project for Mm -hmm. uh, wild cats okay and for some of the species we have very very small for sure so Mm -hmm. we're trying to use transfer learning and figuring that out Mm -hmm. well like for that it's all like again heuristics there's no like one number just like with the thing I said with learning rate, there's no like one number that's the best. But the thing I would do is I would just try do like essentially trial and error. Like for the data that you have right now, I would just try it. And if you have decently like I would say if you have over seventy percent accuracy, then you can probably keep doing it. But if you have like below seventy percent accuracy, this is just like my opinion. But um, if you have below seventy percent accuracy, maybe I'll start like doing some other techniques, like maybe capable cross validation or other techniques to help boost your accuracy. Yeah. But it's a lot of it is like case by case basis. Yeah. Thanks. This might be slightly tangential, but does VS Code currently offer support for Pygame modules? Uh, Pygame? I'm not. I'm honestly not too sure because I mostly work on the data science side of it. But um, I would assume, like, I know our uh, our Python, like the core extension team, they have it basically have like support for everything. So I would assume yes, yeah. But I would definitely double check. But I'm pretty sure it does. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna be in a booth like right outside, right beside the num focus one. So if you have any more questions you want to ask or anything else related to Python or Microsoft or VS Code, feel free to come out. Um, Yeah, thank you.